Hey Mental Nerds, this is Deborah Ferber, and today I want to continue on with Ryan's recent vlog discussion about what exactly it means when we say, to remember is to work for peace. So, those of us who have Facebook accounts, which I think is the majority of us, once we log on, every single day since the election happened, we've been seeing scrolls and scrolls of news feeds and status updates about Trump being president of America. And like Ryan said, that is, at least arguably, the most powerful country in the entire world. There's always a sense of emotionalism and a sense of disconnect every election, I think. It doesn't matter which country you're from. There's always going to be people who are on the side of the so-called winner, and they're going to be quite happy about it. And there's also going to be people who didn't get exactly what they were hoping for, and they might be disappointed. But what I find with this Trump election is that it's actually impacting people a whole lot more than many of the other elections previously. And it's gotten to the point where I have friends all around the world, because those of you who, know, who follow this vlog know that I lived in Scotland. So I have friends in Edinburgh, I have friends in England and Wales, and northern and southern Ireland, and I'm Canadian myself. So we have all these people who are not really personally connected to the United States, or if we are connected, we might have maybe a sibling or another relative or a friend living abroad, in the States I mean, but not us personally. So this is not going to affect our day-to-day -day reality, but yet somehow it does. And a lot of people are saying that the reason why it's affecting us so much is simply because of that underlying current. That even though America is a beautiful country, they're very progressive, they're definitely way advanced and way more developed than the majority of countries in the world, that a lot of people, even including Trump supporters, and that's the interesting thing, are saying that there is still this undercurrent of misogyny, bigotry, homophobia, xenophobia, and so on. And I think it can be easy for us to kind of brush that aside and put that all on Trump. And that's what I see a lot. I see a lot of name calling. I see a lot of sort of insensitive comments. I see even a lot of people unfriending other people or uh, saying, threatening at least that they want to unfriend or unfollow people who have a different political persuasion than them. And they're taking this quite personally. However, I would like to argue that instead of seeing this from the big picture, we should actually focus on it from a much smaller angle. Now, what exactly do I mean by this? Well, I think that being an absolute pacifist myself, and I won't get into the story of how I became an absolute pacifist, because that would probably take too long, but suffice it to say, I struggled with pacifism a lot in my early years as well. You know, when I was 16, I went through a discipleship course, which is when I officially became a Mennonite. And I remember that being the one issue that I just really couldn't get out of my head. And I thought, you know, these Mennonites are so naive. How can you be an absolute pacifist? How can you be believing that under no circumstances there's a war of violence? But the more that I read the scripture, the more that I read the Confession of the Faith, and the more that Mennonite leaders sort of took me under their wings, the more it all began to make sense to me. And so when I went off to university, I was... I think one or one of the few only absolute pacifists, meaning that I don't believe in war in any cause, even in the name of self-defense, that I wouldn't use violence or oppression towards someone. And that often raises a lot of questions, and a lot of times people ask these big sort of questions like, what if uh, someone were to come into your house and they're going to rob you? Or what if your husband were to get murdered in front of you? Or what if World War III breaks out? And sort of all these hypothetical questions that I may or may not face, Lord willing, I hope I would never face such things. And I think in a lot of ways it's used as a defense mechanism. That people use these sort of far-off examples where there's maybe one in a 20th chance that such a thing is actually going to happen, heaven forbid. But they use it as a way to defend themselves saying, I don't need to worry about peace and pacifism in my day-to-day -day life because it's not relevant. But what I want to argue is that when we say 
to remember is to work for peace, that it actually is way more personal than that. We don't look at the big picture in terms of the country of America or of Canada or of the UK or wherever you're from. We don't say, wow, this bad, bad, bad leader. But I would like to encourage us just to think about the ways that we are agreeing or choosing to disagree with people who have voted of a different persuasion than us. Because it's really, when it comes down to it, all of our responsibilities, just like I said before. And how that starts is, first of all, not attacking one another. You may not agree with someone, but there are ways that we can respectfully debate and discuss something. And that goes for both sides. I'm not saying that the Democrats are completely wrong or that the Republicans are completely wrong. It goes for the both of us that we need to do this dance of figuring it out together. We're all in this mess together. Our world is broken. Our world is incomplete, is imperfect. But what can we do as individuals to rise up and be the leaders both nationally and globally that we need to be? The second thing I would encourage you to do is to find ways in your day-to-day -day life that you can make that difference, however small. Because I think a lot of us run to conclusions. You know, so we, I've seen some memes, you know, I've posted some things up myself, so I'm definitely guilty of some of this as well. I'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, I'm highly opinionated, even though I'm a pacifist, so I probably shouldn't be, no, I'm just kidding. But what I'm getting at is, that sometimes we see these memes that say, you know, if you aren't part of the oppressed group, you have no right to tell someone of the oppressed group how to feel. And I definitely agree with that. But I want to add two points to that. Number one, we can't assume who is part of that group or who isn't because you don't know for sure. You know, you can't assume just by looking at someone that they don't have a disability because they might. And the same for me because a lot of people would assume that I... Um, all sorts of things. You know, one of the things people think is I'm white, so I'm privileged, so I have no right to say that I'm not part of a marginalized people group. But those of you who know me, and I've alluded to this in other vlogs as well, I am biracial. And so I bring that picture to the table of having white phenomes, of looking white, but of also having a sense of Asianness about me, even though I might not engage with Asian culture as much as my white culture, but that's still being an important part of who I am. And so what would I would like to encourage you today in terms of practical steps, because for me I'm a very practical person, I always think that there has to be a practical thing, a practical application to go with this. So my practical application for you would be who is one person, maybe from the LGBTQ community, maybe from the disabled community, maybe a uh, someone who is a different nationality or ethnicity than you that you can reach out to and it's about education because I find that a lot of us we might not understand another perspective simply because we haven't been made aware of it simply because we haven't had that opportunity to interact with people of that group so I would encourage you first of all to see who is someone in your immediate community that you can reach out to, that you can hear their story. And then, once you get to know them, how can you work for peace? How can you bridge those divides? How can you be part of the solution instead of the problem? How can you raise up as a global leader? So I'd like to leave that challenge with you. God bless.